question? Yeah. Um, going into an interview, like I'm a very upbeat person and that kind of thing. Like I like to talk and, and that. But is it and I, better to walk in with a very positive attitude that you know what you're talking about in that or should you sit back and wait till they ask you those questions? When it comes to interviewing, you own the platform. You own this conversation. And where I think we make the biggest mistakes when it comes to interviewing is we wait for the question and answer session to happen. It's not a Q&A. It's a conversation. And you want to make sure you're having a two-way dialogue. You are having a discussion. You are, to some extent, manipulating the conversation to go to where you want it to be. So when we talked about the resumes in the past, that helps to spur some of the questions that may come up in an interview's mind to help you do that. But I wouldn't wait for the perfect question to come before I answer something. If there are certain things out there that you want on the table and you can find a creative way to bring it in without rambling, and you are clear and concise, but can find a way to put it in there, I would absolutely put it in. The key is to be clear, concise. You always want to be positive. And when it comes to interviewing, one of the other mistakes that we make is talking about why we want to leave our previous job versus why we really want this one. So I'll ask you a question while you're formulating your new question. If you could be a superhero, who would you be and why? Uh, Superman. Okay. Why? He can be anywhere, anytime, and uh, heartbeat. Okay. Anyone else? If every time you entered a room and your theme song played, what would it be? And why? Probably would be a good song. <laughs> Probably a little inappropriate. You light up my life. Why do you light up my life? Why? Because I do light up people's. I'm a ball of fire. I light up people's lives. Why? It was just bubbling. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. I was talking to a bunch of high school students, and one of them said the Jaws theme. Dun 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 dun. dun, dun. That's funny. And I gave a funny look and they came out with the most incredible answer. Because it gets your attention. Yep. Oh, perfect. It builds up over time. You know that I'm in the room. Yep. And they came out with it. On a scale of one to ten, how weird would you how weird would you consider yourself? And why did you choose that number? On a scale of one to ten, how weird are you? Why did you pick that number? I would say two, because I don't think I'm weird. Now, other people might think I'm weird, but I don't think that I'm weird. Yeah. <laughs> if you saw someone there, steal a quarter, <laughs> steal a quarter, would you report it? And if not, at what dollar amount would you? I would say yes, I would. If you steal a quarter, you're going to steal anything. Yes, I agree. I'm going to steal the problem. <laughs> Why am I asking these questions? Look at your integrity and your... Okay, so integrity, ethics, absolutely yep. a piece of that. Attitude. Because you lost your quarter. Attitude. <laughs> I'm trying to find where that my quarter went. <laughs> and how you think feel back. about yourself, right? How so you right. feel about yourself. Yep. And think back to just a few minutes ago when I asked that first question, and then the next one, and the next one. And think back to how you react. Think back to the potential look on your face when I'm staring you in the face and asking you this question. What's your theme song? Some of your eyes were this big. Some of your jaws hit the floor. Some of your shoulders went. Is there a perfect answer to an interview? No. Well. no. no. Do you, can I ask a question on that? Absolutely. Do you feel like in the middle of an interview, someone may throw out a question like that once in a while? Like if you were interviewing somebody, would you 
all of a sudden just throw in a question like that to see how somebody reacted. What's your... If you could be a tree, what type of tree would you be? Everybody will see you. I was thinking Christmas. And it makes them happy. I like oak because it's strong and year round. <laughs> My answer is I would expect. Interviewers are not looking for a perfect answer. Interviewers are looking for how you deal with pressure, how you can communicate. Are you independent in your thinking? Are you creative in your thinking? Are you innovative in your thinking? If I put you into a pressure situation, i.e. an interview, and you're giving me this type of reaction, it is going to create questions for me as the interviewer if I was to give you this job. How would you react if you had to deal with a difficult customer situation? I am looking for a reaction. So as the interviewee, don't give me the reaction except a positive one. And even if you need a second to say, hold on a second, let me think about this. That's okay to take that five, ten seconds to say, that's an interesting question. You just answered me. There is no perfect answer to any question, so stop trying to find one. You know what the hardest question is for most people? What's your greatest thing? No, what's your greatest accomplishment? Oh, greatest accomplishment. Although weakness, but we'll talk about that in a moment. What's your greatest accomplishment? Right now, write down your three greatest accomplishments. Does Go. Be professional accomplishments or just in general? I'll answer that in a moment. The question was, do they have to be professional? I'm going to count down from 10 and you better be done. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Heads down. Why did I count down? Okay. How many of you actually had three accomplishments written down? Okay, about half. For those that had the three, now change the order on them. Does it matter? No. The greatest accomplishment is to you. What do you feel is your greatest accomplishment that's there? You could ask me a question today of what my greatest accomplishment is in five minutes from now. I might change it. Do you know? Would you care? What's interesting is it, the hardest thing for us to do is to talk about us. This is the middle of an interview. This is all about you. It is not bragging if it is a fact. So you need to figure out what your facts are that make you who you are to tell your story. So when you are talking about yourself, which makes people a little uneasy, is try to find a way to get comfortable with talking about yourself. So that means when you talk about yourself, you're not saying, I'm a great communicator, I'm a great leader, I'm a great persuader. I'm a... I haven't told you anything. Like, that's bread. If I come back and say, I've joined Toastmasters, it has made me a better communicator. That's a fact. Last year I was a Toastmaster of the Year. That's a fact. Do I run up and down the street saying, look at me, I'm Toastmaster of the Year? <laughs> no, but in the appropriate situations I do. And even if I'm not asked the question, I might find a way to slip it in. And not here's a list of all my accomplishments, not because you didn't ask me, but I'm going to find a way of I've worked on my communication skills because I've been told for 20 years my performance appraisals that I needed to improve it, so I took the actions, and it paid dividends by having me announce as last year's Toastmaster of the Year. One of my Achilles heels is to think quickly on my feet. 
Toastmasters has a contest. It's an impromptu contest. It's two minutes long. You're given a question up on stage. You don't know what it is. You have to answer it between one to two minutes. And if you are before or after that, you are disqualified. And what was your question? My question was, what is your greatest technological advancement within your lifetime? Oh. Go what ahead. was your answer? Well, my answer was, because remember, this is a speech. Not where people make the biggest mistake there is just as you would in an interview, is just answer the question, yes or no, or however it's laid out to you. So I had a little fun with it. Hello, well. And then I started talking about the pros of being able to email and instant message people throughout the entire world anytime you want it to get a hold of somebody. But we also had technological advance, the technological issues with the microphones throughout the weekend. So I said, as we have had problems with technology before, there's also problems with instant communication. And then when I talked about the emotional components of it and how you send those ones you want to grab back and you can't and how it's also culturally uh, making us a electronic and it's, it's taking it away is. from building relationships. And I can tell you, I am the district table topics champion. And I tell you that as a fact, not because of brag. So there's two questions that were brought up here. One was, whatever you talk about when it comes to your weaknesses, did you think either one of those were my weaknesses? No. I can easily answer them as my strengths or my weaknesses. Right. It's not bragging if it's a fact. So your weaknesses, being the son of a father who was an HR director for 25 years with Sears Roebuck and Company, I've been mock interviewed more times than you can shake a stick at. And I very clearly remember my freshman year in college when I was asked the question in a mock interview with my father. Give me your three weaknesses. Here's three of them and four, here's seven of them. Just take them. And I just listed them because I answered the question as it was asked. There's a story. And you've got to make sure that you're not just leaving your weaknesses on the table as weaknesses. They should come out as your strengths and the actions you've taken to do it. And there was a second point that was brought up. Is it personal or is it professional when it comes to accomplishments? The answer is you can make it both. But let me explain how. If you want to say your greatest accomplishment is you're, you're the greatest mother on earth, or you're the greatest father on earth, or you've been able to rear three beautiful children, I consider those to be incredible accomplishments. Or you have 17 dogs. Whatever your personal piece is. You have to figure out, though, is know your audience. Are you going to offend somebody with those comments? Are they going to think your entire world revolves around them? And by the way, it probably should. But it doesn't have to come out in an interview like that. You can say what's important to you or show the balance between work and family. I would never say I'm so 100% committed to work that I would never even think of my kids, or homework, or hobbies, or any of that. So what you might want to do, your answers in an interview should most likely revolve around the professional side of it. But don't be afraid to put your personal vulnerability out on the table if it makes sense to the work that's out there. So maybe you're interviewing for a bank teller position. You're going to have to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. You need to be personal. You need to build relationships. Why not come out and say, I've been able to rear three beautiful children, and it's not easy. But my three greatest business accomplishments are A, B, and C. So now you can tie it together so you're, it doesn't become an or statement, it becomes an A. Would you say it would be okay in a situation like that, you know, my greatest accomplishment is, you know, rearing my three children, but through that I've been able to learn multitasking, budgeting, um, conflict resolution, and I've applied these to my professional career? Absolutely. Because you have to remember everything you've done in your life ties into what you're doing right now, your whole as a person. Think about it. 
So if you're sitting in a collections position, but you're interviewing for a sales position, can you connect the dots between the two? Mm -hmm. All right, let's do it. Let's connect those dots. You have to sell the so you have to sell to the customer. They have to pay. Maybe they can only pay one company. You have to persuade them to pay you. You have to build trust. You have to build trust. You have to be empathetic in the event that business is down for that person. You have to understand the customer. Be empathetic. Be sympathetic. Know who they are. Know what their wants and needs are. Figure out what you can do for them on an individual basis. Be a good listener. Be an absolute effective listener. Absolutely. Be able to curtail the conversation to the type of person you're talking to. Curtail. So think about the individual, be persuasive, be influential, get results. Collection, sales, it's all the same. So unless you're really going for a technical position such as accounting or finance, you have the ability to make these connections with all the jobs that you have. And you need to figure out how do I pull that string all the way through to make sure that I can do that. So now let's get back to the question. If you could be a tree, what would you be? You also have to be flexible. And so when I ask the question of, do you want to be a superhero or do you want to be a tree, a lot of the answers, and I know it may be the environment we're in at this very moment of, I'd be Superman, or I'd be an oak, or I'd be a birch, I'd be a Christmas tree. And then you wait. You should have the question asked why at the end of every single question that is asked of you. Even if it is a closed-ended question, you should tack on in your head the question why and elaborate. It doesn't mean go down a 20-minute dissertation about rambling on and on about whatever you felt the question was. I asked somebody in, a, in an interview a few weeks ago, I said, Tell me a little bit about yourself professionally. It's an icebreaker question. I hit mute and I sat there for 20 minutes. I could have gone in and interrupted, but why should I have to do that as the interview? You need to be clear, you need to be concise, you need to be succinct. So if you don't have one right now, <laughs> Get yourself a two-minute elevator speech. What do we mean by an elevator speech? From the time that you get into the elevator until the time that you get out of the elevator, you should have, had, should have had it all out. You should have every bit of the most important pieces about you ready to roll at the tip of your tongue. <laughs> Interviewing is not about memorizing. So I don't want you to say, next time I'm asked a question, what type of tree do I want to be? It's going to be oak. Because I'm going to change on you three minutes from now. I'm going to be an oak one time, a pine one time, a birch one time. It shouldn't matter because it's about my reaction. It's about my communication. It's about my ability to tell a story. So as I'm telling you this story, this two-minute elevator speech needs to be ready. And I've been telling this elevator piece of this program for years. I got an email on Friday. I was in Charlotte with a bunch of my peers in an offsite. And I landed in Maine, and there was an email from my peer who said, I worked out in the gym this morning at the hotel. I got into the elevator, and guess who I ran into? Our CEO. <laughs> he asked what I did, and I told him. It lasted a minute. Will he remember him? I don't know. But he was strong enough and confident enough to be able to have a conversation where a lot of us would have been like, I am Tom, and I work for you in Maine. I, I don't know. Or, hi, Tom, glad to meet you, and that's it. Here's your chance. They don't present themselves often. Are you ready to have that conversation? So let's go back to the question on, What's your greatest accomplishment? 
If you don't know what they are, and you struggled in a situation like this to come up with one, your homework after this is to go back and write down a few that are meaningful for you, personal and professional, and give them context. So when someone does ask you the question, what type of tree do you want to be, it's oak, and it's because it's strong. It has a root system that, can, that grows, so I'll continue to learn. It can be there during many envir environments, even if they're turmoil. If there's turmoil going on, they are standing strong. So in the middle of a storm, I can be there for you. When it's hot, I'll be shaped for you. When it's cold, I have branches that can protect you from the wind. Do you see how I'm tying it potentially back to the job I'm interviewing for? And it's interesting you said Christmas tree. Because that's the second time I've heard that answer. Is Christmas tree a real tree? It's a pine. Does it matter? And I'm glad you said Christmas tree because it doesn't. It's creative. It's innovative. It's festive. You have a good solid answer behind, behind it. Go with it. Run with it. I sat in another one of the schools talking to some seniors. And this kid said, be a cat. <laughs> and all his friends were like, is cactus a tree? And he sat there with all the confidence in the world, and he said, because I'm prickly. But I don't need a lot to survive. And I'm independent. And I make things happen. And I'm protected. And I'll make sure I'm protected. And this is a guy that Somewhere, he's probably the guy who sits in the back of the class and just hangs out because that's a reaction his friends had, and they went, wow. Because it doesn't matter if cactus is a tree or not. He was creative, he was innovative, and he had a good, solid answer behind it. He answered the question, why, before I even got a chance to have to ask him. As the interviewer, don't make me do all the work. And that just means making it a Q&A type situation is I'm going to answer it the way I think you want it answered, then I'm going to sit there. When it comes to interviewing, be yourself. Find ways for you to, be, to differentiate yourself and bring yourself out from who you really are. Individualize it. Differentiate yourself by coming out and just being who you are. If you're trying to answer a question the way you think I, the interviewer, want to hear it, it's not genuine. And most of the time it comes out pretty clearly it's not genuine. Because now you're answering questions that aren't felt in your heart and head. So now, to some extent, you're creating some brand new answer that you hadn't been thinking about because it's not who you are. It's not your background. It's not you comes across as fake, not genuine, and when it comes across that way, you're not saying it confidently. The interview is about confidence. I call 98% of the interview confidence. It's not bragging if it's a fact. So I had an interview. I was tapped on the shoulder, which by the way does not happen that often. They said, hey, I think you might be good for this job. You ought to go for it. I said, okay. I went through five interviews, and the person who tapped me on the shoulder, I'm sitting there waiting to see if I'm going to move on to the top two and speak to the last person. And I said, so you talk to these people on a regular basis, how do I do? <laughs> and she said, four of them said, you were confident, you had a clear plan of attack. You had a vision of where you think you wanted this to be. You were clear, you were concise, your communication skills were great, the fifth person thought you were a cop. <laughs> How did I sleep that night? Great. One says I didn't, one says I slept great. I slept like a baby. And the reason I slept like a baby is one, it's one person. Now, I went back and I reassessed how I did the interviews. 
I said, oh, are there things I could have done better? Where could that person may have thought I was cocky because maybe I crossed over the line from confidence to cocky? And it's a fine line. But if I gave very similar answers to five people and four thought I was confident and one thought I was cocky, it's just a perception of that. But you also have to remember, I was some guy all the way over here on the spectrum of nervous, introverted, shy, lacking confidence for a very long time in my career. So the fact that I had four people tell me I was confident was better than anything else I've ever heard. Because that confidence took a long time to build up. So did you get the job? I absolutely got the job. In fact, the cocky, the person who thought I was cocky was probably one of my bigger supporters when I started the job. Now, I have to ensure that I rein it in so I don't come across as cocky to everybody, but you come across as confident, and it took me a long time to get to this point. But I want to exude confidence. I want you to know when I show up on your doorstep to start this job on day one, that not only do I have a plan for day one, I have a plan for day 30, day 60, day 90, and I'm ready to attack this thing and go in. I had an HR director, a friend of mine, who said in an interview, it was like a first date. <laughs> I'm going to dress to the nines. I'm going to give you the best that I have to give. And if after the end of the interview, I think you were average, it's like a first date. It all goes down from there. <laughs> from there. When you start your job, if that's the best you can give, and you gave me everything you could in a half hour or an hour, and I still think you're average, I have to equate that you're average. If this is the best you have, when you come to work every single day, it's going to be a lower notch. If your best was average, I have questions. So when it comes to the interview, and it's not about how you dress, and it's not even about impressing the, interview, the interviewer, it's about making sure that the true you comes out so they know exactly what they're getting when they hire you. But put your effort into it. I had an interview a couple months ago, and the person says to me, hey, I'd like to learn a little bit more about this job. And I said, okay, what do you know already? They say, I don't know anything. I thought you can tell me during the interview what it is. I said, what homework have you done? And they said, I haven't done anything. And my head said, we've got a problem. You've put no effort in except to fill out an application. I've got questions. That's the best you can give me? When I need you to go research that big project, are you going to do it for me? It's okay to ask a question to say, this is what I know based off of the homework I've done. Could you tell me a little bit more? Could you elaborate? Could you explain what the day-to-day -day job responsibilities would be? All of those questions are absolutely fine. But to say I know nothing about what you're doing and I'm applying for it anyway, you jump into everything with both feet? Let's put a toe in the water. What other questions? You know, uh, doing research on uh, something that you've applied for also can tell you if it's a bogus company or not. So, you know, what you're stepping into, is that actually what you really want to do? Yeah, there are a lot of things that you can do to do the homework, and the internet is a great place to start. Absolutely. You understand what is the philosophy, what's the mission, what's the culture like? Is it big? Is it small? I mean, when I went to college, I had to think, do I want to go to a really big college, a medium one, or a small one? Because there are differences when it comes to culture. Same thing when it comes to companies. Do you want a small one? Do you want a mom and pop one? Do you want an extremely large one? There are pros and cons to all of those, but you have to know what you're getting into. 
You want to talk to people who have worked there if you know someone who's there. And figure out what is the real culture. Is it just on paper? Or do they live it? Do they breathe it? Is this culture just exuding from people all over the place? And that's a very positive, upbeat, constant, constantly driving culture. I mean, if you were to ask the culture of Apple, I think a few of you can kind of figure out what that culture is. It's intense. You probably work a ton of hours, but you probably have a good time doing it. Is that what you want within the culture? Because when you interview, you're not the only one being interviewed. You're interviewing them. You're interviewing the, that person who's asking you the questions. You have the right and obligation to ask them questions. Because you want to ensure this is what you want to get into. You want to make sure you're not just guessing your next career move. That you know exactly what you're walking into or a version of what you're walking into. So you could then say, when a job is offered to me, I can then make a very informed decision of whether I really want this or not. Because it's not all about the pay. It's about your love for the job. Not do you like it, will you learn to love it? Because your satisfaction level will drive your efficiency or productivity. It will drive your next career move. It will drive your trajectory. It will get you to where you want to be. And coming to work every day miserable stinks. Find something you like. Or, if you're going to find something just to hold you over, which, by the way, welcome to reality, Find something that uses the skills that you like using to then become a stepping stone to your next position. So you don't want to just look at short-sighted this job right in front of me. Try to figure out what can be your next stepping stones from them. Maybe all my jobs have been on the phone. Maybe this one I'm looking at is something I might be testing to speak to someone one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe it might get me in further into the sales field out on the street. <laughs> Let me check it out. I have a couple of questions. Um, Fire but, um, Do you recommend always following up with the people that you interview with? Not necessarily internally, but externally as well. Hey, thank you very much for taking the time. You know, for inter you know, do you recommend that we do that? Because it's a dog eat dog world out there. Just to get an interview, it's difficult. And then when you're in there, you're one of you know 60 to 100 candidates, from what I can see. How do you make yourself shine afterwards so that they remember you if you were number one versus number 60? It takes 69 or 70 interviews for every person who's hired out there. In the most recent study that I've seen, the study's probably about six months old. Is that, do you think that's higher numbers with the way the economy's going there? It's, the economy drove some of those numbers. I've got to imagine that number has come down as recovery has slowly inched its way up. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it is a nationwide average. So when you have thousands of people interviewing for one job in a high populated area, so I don't want to scare you with that number. But how do you make yourself different when it comes to saying thank you for having this discussion? I did a speed networking event in Texas. I spent three hours, 20 minutes a pop meeting with people. So that's I met with nine people over that three hour span. That group who was leading and organizing the event required their folks to hand us thank you notes. So I got nine cards saying virtually the same thing immediately after the event. How special did I feel? No. 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 I have the greatest wife in the world. She does not celebrate Valentine's Day. And the reason is she doesn't want to be one of many when flowers and cards are sent to everyone. She wants to be made special. It's the same type of thing as the interviewers. I don't want to sit here and get a hundred cards laid out on my desk immediately after the interview. But a couple ways to do it is maybe you have a follow-up item, or maybe there was an intriguing question 
or a discussion that was taking place and maybe you picked up on an article that came through. So maybe say, hey, I was reading something and it related back to our discussion we had on value-add propositions in the workplace. I thought you might enjoy this and you send them a link to the article. You don't want to wait three months. You don't want to feel the obligation that you have to do this. But if you do the interview right, part of that interview is building a relationship, finding a connection, having that singular eye to eye. I feel great. I want to work for you. I want to work for this company. I want to work in this culture. Connection. If you have that connection, your card, your email, your letter should reflect that. Something personal that took place within that. I had an interview with somebody at one point, and they were talking about my thirst to learn. And it came up in the interview, I'd really like to dig in and understand and come up a learning curve. And they said about themselves, I forced myself to take Spanish. I went to take a Spanish class because I kept saying for years, I want to go in and just learn Spanish. And they said, I'm going to take Spanish. I want you to get your MBA and doing something else. And we just had this fun conversation. So I sent him a note back saying, hola, how's the Spanish going? And then I talked to him about the decisions I made relating to my MBA. That I had just, I had been working through, you know, building up the Toastmasters component, learning about speeches, building up my confidence and communication skills. So I said, I'm going to defer right now, but I appreciate the dialogue. And it was able to differentiate myself with him as a person based off of our connection. Not thank you for the time for the interview. It was great talking to you. Sincerely, Tom. You have to find an individual touch point. So I would make sure that you find a way to differentiate yourself and assume it's not going to be right. Because a lot of times we might be dependent on that thing to be the final piece of the puzzle to get it for us. I tell you as an interviewer, the letters are nice. I make zero decisions off of that letter. I don't recall any time in my life I've ever made a decision because I've got a card back. In fact, what I have found, it's an interesting perception because I was thinking of it after this event where I went to the speed networking. How many times have I made a decision based off of this card? And actually, a lot of the cards I got or an email I may have gotten from someone came from someone who felt they, they most likely struggled in the interview. That's an interesting perspective right there. Because it really, it came down to, I'm begging and pleading because I really want this job. Mm -hmm. That's how the, the email came across, or the letter came across, or the card came across. Now, I've gotten phenomenal emails and letters from people, so please make sure you don't, I'm not making. Well, that's what I was going to say. Do you feel like that's a red flag just overall? Like, don't do that because that's how you're going to look kind of desperate like you need the job? Or I wouldn't call it a red flag. I would call it, if you are sending it because you feel desperate after the interview, <laughs> you ought to question whether you should send it. If you are sending it because you feel the obligation to send it, I'm not sure if you ought to send it. I guess I'm just I going on the old etiquette. Like, you know, you, somebody gives you something, you're thankful for what they gave you. And I, I, it's hard sometimes to pull away from that because of the way that you've been taught for the, for the past several years. And, and etiquette is extremely important. I don't want to take away from the etiquette piece. I replace all my divots when I play golf. But I want to make sure you understand the, re the reasoning behind it. When I replace my divots playing golf, it's because I don't want a big brown dirt spot there. Because there's more behind it. Make your connection with that person more meaningful. So it's past the obligation. It's past the etiquette. You're doing it because you truly felt like you built a relationship with that person or built something to work from because now your letter, the words you choose, will reflect that.
I think you have to walk into that interview and say, I've, I've got to leave here. When they, when I walk out that door, they're going to say, wow. And they're going to walk out of that interview saying, boy, this person's got it together, or whatever. But something that will wow them. You know, the wow factor of, I have to, as the interviewer, feel compelled to hire you. I really want to say there is no questions being asked here. You're in. Here's this person I'm hiring, and here's 72 other people below you. It's not are you in the top three, it's you are the top. When you are interviewing, who are you competing against? Yourself. That's right, you're your biggest competition. You are the only thing holding you back. Is it your confidence? Is it your communication? Is it your leadership? You are your toughest competition, and you hold yourself back a lot of times because you're not sure you want to brag about yourself. You're it. It's not bragging if it's a fact. Bring all those facts about you and put them out on the table. I had an interview for a leadership development type program. I went through seven interviews. They were hiring 15 people. Guess what number I was? One. 16. <laughs> and what's interesting is, when they said you're not getting this job, I said, well, can you provide me the feedback? And they said, well, there was an opportunity for you in the interview to talk more about the things that you've accomplished, the things that you want to do, the things that you've done. And I said, but it's all there on my resume. And they said, assume nobody read your resume. You have to bring it alive. You have to make sure that they understand who you are. You need to ensure that in this two-way dialogue, dialogue, discussion, that they know who you are at the end of this thing, so they can make a very clear decision. They were muddy. They didn't know who exactly you were. I probably didn't come across as confident. I probably didn't come across as persuading or influential the things that they needed within that leadership development program. It was a good lesson to learn to brag a little bit about yourself by using the facts. Because when I came back in this feedback session, as I said, I was a top performer. I hit it, my incentives multiple times in a row. I had a project that I was a leader of, and they said none of that came out in the interview. And there was my aha moment of, oh, why didn't I say that in the interview? That interview where you um, were at work, four of them said that you were confident, and one said you were cocky. Did you go back? Because there is a fine line between confidence and cocky, like where you went wrong, or what was the issue that made him perceive that you were cocky? I was very cautious in how I did that because I didn't want to come across then as defensive. And so I was, I was under the impression that it was a collective, all five of them were going to make the decision to move me on to the next level. So I had, there were a couple points to my answers where I said I could understand where the person probably thought I was cocky. And I said, but the others, I answered it probably a very similar way. They thought I was on the other side of, of confidence. Um, so I didn't go back to them. Now, what I did do is I, I went through the overall interview because I knew I was going to work with this group because they were key business partners in HR. They were key business partners in finance and several other places. So I got a chance to get to know who they were. And what I figured out was when I went back, not just saying, are you confident or are you cocky, I was also said, was I able to build a relationship with them? And that person was the one person I said, I'm not sure if I built that strong enough relationship. I didn't feel as if there was a strong bond there. I felt like I was answering his questions and he got it. But I still felt, like I ended the conversation saying, huh, I wonder how that went. And that's a tough way to end an interview. Because you should always say, that went well, there might be a couple opportunities there. When you say, huh, I'm not sure, I actually self-reflected and said, what are some of the things I could have done to change the interview a little bit, control the flow maybe a little bit, potentially even be a better listener. Was there a chance, maybe I was doing too much talking, I don't know. So then you take a step back and you say, could I have been a better listener? 
And so now you do it because part of the interview is understanding who your audience is. Do you know your audience? Or are you just going to say, here are all my facts, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And if that's the case, you're, that's not an interview. You have to understand your cues from the interviewer. And if they want you to wrap it up, look at their eyes. Or if it's over the phone, figure out their tone of voice. If you haven't heard from them in 20 minutes, you might want to ask them a question. Are you still there? <laughs> be a good listener and be someone who can understand people's cues well enough. They're nonverbal type behaviors. So you're making it based off of that individual, not because you just want to get everything you want out in 30 minutes. And maybe during that situation, I try to get all of me out in 30 minutes versus pulling back and making it more of a relationship building. It's a great question. What else? Well, I think too, like in that circumstance, you know, you have one person that is a little bit different as far as the opinion goes, but it's also their, all their experiences, you know, maybe they had somebody in their life that was overbearing or whatever, so they don't like that at all. So that you really just have to be confident in what you do and how, because you can't control how other people take it. And as long as you're doing the best you can do. Uh, and the point that I think you're making here, and I understand, is you're only as good as the person perceiving who you are. So your real you may not come across as real to that other person. So I can tell you I'm a great communicator, I'm a great leader, I haven't told you anything. That's why I talk about facts. It's not bragging if it's a fact. If you've achieved incentive 10 out of 12 months, if you were an all-star, meaning you were a top performer in the top 5% of your organization, three years running, that's a fact. And now people get to see your performance happening on paper, it's real now. So instead of just coming out saying I'm a great communicator, I can come out and say I've been able to help 100 customers a day on the phone. That equates to a lot of customers and then you can build it out. And you start building these facts of I was given a portfolio of five million dollars a month to collect from. It shows responsibility shows you've been able to achieve your results. It's again pulling that string all the way through to turn it into a fact. I've had a number of interviews where I've been narrowed down from about, you know, like 70 or so people and I'm at one of the final interviews and uh, they bring up, they'd be like, you know, I'm just sitting here listening to you and you would be amazing at another position that's posted. Um, and while like it would fall under my kind of hobbies and passion, how would you address that? Or like if I have a degree in business and IT, though I've decided I want to go the business route, and they brought up IT jobs, how do you kind of acknowledge it in a positive way that say, you know, but this is really the one I want? Or The question is how do you turn the tide of something you want based off of your love for it? say, listen, I've done my homework. This is a position I feel I am most qualified for and can make the biggest difference in in the shortest period of time. And I think this is where my skill set will be. I appreciate the guidance. In fact, I'll look into it. Because if, hopefully it's part of the company they're offering it. Yeah, yeah, they all have Maybe I can look at that as a long-term opportunity in my future growth. I appreciate you giving me the runway to do that. Or, you might even be able to say, that's interesting, I never thought about that. Could you tell me a little bit more about it? And then you say, are you, are you saying that you think that I, I might be a better fit? So there, here's your time to ask clarifying and confirming questions. Say, do you think I'd be a better fit there? And if they say yes, now you know how this interview is going, and you may want to say, well, is there somebody I should reach out to and speak to about this potential position? Or what are your feelings relating back to this one? Are you saying that I should pursue this one versus this one? And asking those types of questions so really makes you can address that? There. Absolutely. Okay. I, the first interview I ever had, real interview, for a non-summer job, I showed up, and it was a phone position, mostly part-time. 
I graduated college a, a semester early, so pretty much thought I'd play around for six months. And the interviewer said, great answers, you communicated well, you're going to leave me in two weeks. <laughs> no, I want all I want is a paycheck every two weeks. Yeah. He came out and he said, listen, let's have a conversation. What do you really want to do? Because at that point, I didn't know. And it came across very clearly I didn't know. It came across very clearly all I wanted was a part-time job to be paid every two weeks. And that's how my answers came across. <laughs> Instead, he turned it around and said, I've got some full-time positions. Here's the description of those jobs. Your skill set sounds like it can match some of these or these of any interest to you. And then we talked about these and pretty much pulled my application from there and he shifted it on. 22 years later, still with the same company. Because an interviewer was strong enough to say this isn't for you. This is. So when you ever find yourself in that position to be the interviewer, don't just think short-sighted about your position that you're interviewing for. Think about the company as a whole. And there's been many a times where I've had that conversation with someone and I've gotten their name off to someone else. Because it's a matter of what's best for the company. And if what's best for the company is using your skill set and you can find enjoyment and satisfaction at it, it's a win for everyone. I think it's important too to not interview for positions just for the sake of having a job because you need the security. You know, because you're wasting everybody's time, but most of all, you're wasting yourself because you could have potentially found a better fit for yourself. Yeah, security is overrated, but it is necessary. <laughs> it is necessary. Uh, what you don't want to do is put yourself into Mr. Holland's Opus <laughs> situation where you just take this job for the sake of taking a job. Know what you're taking it for. And what's interesting is a little, little lessons learned from Mr. Hollis, the Hollis Opus, if you ever watched the movie, is he took something because he had a skill set that worked, he enjoyed it kind of, and he learned a lot. And he realized the value he added in all of it. It had nothing to do with it. His goals were just out of whack. He wanted to do something else, and he found out he was able to do that. It's the same type of thing. See, if you find yourself in a position because you're out of a job, and you want or need to get into something to pay your bills, there's nothing wrong with that. Just try to find one, if you can, that aligns it, and be strong enough to say, what are my next steps? Because even if you're getting a part-time job or a short-term, long-term, or short-term, full-time job, do it for the right reasons be two steps ahead of yourself. What happens here? And that's a fair question to ask in the middle of an interview is, what are the next steps for you? I had a coaching session with someone who said that they have two jobs that they were negotiating salaries with. One paid 35000 one paid 41000 She said, I want this one, the 41000 because it's a little easier. I said, tell me more about this one, the 35000 They said, well, it's a lot harder. I've got to do more work, and I'm not paid as much. I said, but where are you going from here? And they said, well, I can turn into a leadership position, a management position. It was within the publishing business. And they said, I could then move up into publishing and then editing, and then I can move up. And there's this growth track that's out there. And I said, take me back to the 41,000. What's your growth track here? And they said, I don't know. I said, based off of what you're describing, there isn't one. Short-sighted decision just for the pay. Long-term for a lifetime of satisfaction and probably a whole lot more pay. Make the right decisions when you do it. Think it all the way through. Think holistically.